I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Rob, uh, a little while ago, I, we had a, a listener write in suggesting that we do more literary works from Hong Kong. And I actually had had taught this work that we're looking at today, Shishi's Floating City, uh, several years ago, and I really liked it. And so immediately I was like, let's do that. Rob, this was your first time reading anything by Shishi, right? Yes, it is. What did you think of her writing? You know, I'm not sure. So my one of my questions, do you think this is representative of her writing or is this kind of an outlier? I, I think it is representative of both her mm-hmm. writing and the kind of sort of postmodernism in Hong Kong in general. It's a funny one. I have to say the jury's still out for me on this one because there are certain passages that feel sort of absurdist and interesting. I keep thinking of people that sound like other people, but I don't know if you've ever read Mikhail Bulgakov, the Russian writer, but he wrote yes. The Master and Margarita. Feels a little like Bulgakov in places where you're like, that's really weird, and I'm not sure I understand it, but I kind of like it. Yeah, I, I think that I see your point. I don't like uh, Bulgakov. I do like Shi Shi, and I do Interesting. really like this story. Just should I briefly introduce this story? Yeah, go for it. It's hard to say what this story is about, right, Rob? It's just kind of... Yeah, it doesn't really have a plot. <laughs> it's a kind of uh, speculative fiction uh, portrait of Hong Kong. You have all of these kind of different elements happening, uh, but there's there's no... Yeah, you're right, Rob. There, there's no plot. We have the creation of the city, which is Hong Kong, but it's just referred to as the floating city. Pirates come by, there's there's lots of banging, um, and the city floats between different worlds. It kind of floats between the sky and the water, which I think represents, to a certain degree, the Hong Kong floating between China and the West. It's in a very precarious situation. Uh, the winds kind of blow it every season, but it never blows away. Uh, it has these uh, this weird mix of, of West and East, or probably more proper to say China and and the West. You know, she has uh, she refers to an ex- exhibition of paintings that's being held. Magritte, René Magritte. The city is holding an exhibition of a painter, René Magritte. Uh, one of his his famous works is "This is not an apple," and it has a an image of an apple. And of course, the the point, as as the story explicates, is that you know, this is not actually an apple, it's just an image. Uh, and, and the thing that she's trying to hit with this as a, as a writer is that, you know, this is not what it appears. If you could say it had something like a plot, it just kind of goes through and narrates the history of Hong Kong as a very speculative kind of thing. People are at one point trying to leave and floating away to other parts of the world, which is kind of an allusion to the 1980s. Lots of folks from Hong Kong uh, left Hong Kong because they were scared of Hong Kong coming under the control of the communist in 1997. Uh, so they, they immigrated to other parts of the world. Uh, Vancouver, particularly, I actually had a, a classmate in Georgia who was who was from Hong Kong. Lots of people did this, and, and there's this sense that, that she, she is is using these all, these kind of weird images of, of, an apple and of people floating away. I'm not doing it justice, right, Rob? The the sort of the kind of just incredibly weird nature of this story is a rehearsal of Hong Kong's history. I think that's sort of what I'm going to sort of do a here's what I like, here's what I didn't like approach to this. But one of the things that kind of left me cold was that knowing the the background of the story Every single thing I read in the story felt like a clear symbol of something that happened for real in Hong Kong history. Oh, right. You don't like symbols, do you, as a literature? I don't like symbols when they're either when they're so on the nose, (laughs) when you're like, clearly everyone liking this painting means some aspect of, of Hong Kong history. When you can't distance yourself at all from the, I don't want to say, it's not really a symbol. From the allegory, perhaps, like nothing in the in the story feels like. It doesn't feel like she's actually trying to create a world. It feels like she's just sort of giving us an alternate version of Hong Kong history, and for me, it just it didn't work as well because I thought, all right, I'm not really sure why this is here, except clearly it it stands for something in Hong Kong history. If the only reason the story exists is to retell Hong Kong history, and not even in a particularly 
I don't even I don't know if it's a particularly engaging way. There were a lot of sections in the story where I remember thinking, that's that's a kind of interesting detail, but I'm not really sure I care about anything in this section. It, that that part kind of left me cold. But I mean, it's so absurdist that I think you have to have these symbols grounded in something concrete. There's like the the passage where the the all of the mirrors in the floating city they don't ever show the fronts of things. They only show the backs of things. Uh, yeah. You know, like, how do you deal with that? That's not connected to anything concrete, but it's just this kind of absurd world. In on, And in some of the details, it's a very absurd world, and it's just hard to figure out what's going on. And I was reading it and trying to, to kind of put things together, and it it's so strange that I think the the things that you see, Rob, as too on the nose, for me, I felt like they were necessary as a kind of grounding mechanism because otherwise I would just float away. Um, and the thing about the floating world that she, she constructs is it doesn't float away. It just kind of stays there uh, hovering between the water and the sky, never quite uh, falling down into the water, never actually floating away. And I, I felt like those concrete symbols, which you were not happy with were the grounding element. It's it's less that I'm le- I'm not happy with the concrete symbols. It's more that there are some sections where it's very well done and it does feel very absurd and strange. And I'm like, what is going on here? And, but like the, I'll give you an example of what I mean for that one. Sure. There's part three is just called showers. And I'll just read this paragraph because I think it's really nice. It says May to September was the windy season. The winds blew from all directions and the floating city swayed in the sky. The residents of the floating city were used to the swaying, and they went about their business as usual, not even missing the races. They knew from experience that the floating city would never be blown upside down or in circles during the windy season, nor would it be blown away to some other place. That feels kind of whimsical and fun. It's the kind of detail where I suddenly go, oh, I can see something interesting about this city. And then, of course, it goes on. They, they have this shared dream that happens, and that is one of those things that reminds me of Bulgakov. And then you have, like, the very next section is all of them pondering a painting by Magritte. And there, I, it's, it's, I'm not sure exactly how to describe the impact that that has on me, but the, the section three on showers it feels like a very lived detail. I can see the people in the city. I can see this really weird thing that they're all participating in. Then the next section is basically a three-paragraph meditation on Magritte. And I, I'm like, why do we need a three-paragraph meditation on Magritte after a really wonderful passage on that? Rob, can I ask you, did you not think that the passage in uh, passage number three, the showers passage, was that not symbolic to you? It was, but it's, and this is, it's hard for me to articulate why that doesn't work. This is one of my problems. One of your many problems. One of my many problems. <laughs> I have so many. No, that is true. It's very true. Thank you for pointing that out as a good podcasting partner. <laughs> but it, it's, so there's, there's lots of texts that are highly elusive and symbolic. And when they're done well, you can read them either as purely symbolic or you can just read the story. Orwell's Animal, Animal Farm is a good example. I mean, the the references to history are obvious and clear, but the characters in the story are well done enough that you can sort of forget that that's happening. In the sections in this story that I don't like, it's like CC will not let you just get immersed in the floating city. Like, no, don't think about it as a real place. It's really just a symbol. Just don't even think about it as an interesting, whimsical creation. I'm going to make sure you know that we're actually talking about this, the city, the, the, the history of Hong Kong. The showers section definitely has, I'm, I'm sure, clear links to Hong Kong history. I couldn't tell you offhand exactly what they were. You might be able to. There, some of the other details, like this shared dream, is so peculiar that I don't immediately think, oh, I see where this is going. Okay, fine. Rob, I'm, I'm just a little struck because when you talked about how you were disappointed by how on the nose the symbolism was, I immediately thought you were referring to the showers section, the the passage number three, because it's so such a clear allusion to Hong Kong's nature as a kind of in-between space and uh, a geo- geopolitical in-between space of being buffeted by by these uh, winds from from China and from from the West and and how it's tossed about. Uh, I mean, obviously, 
Hong Kong has t- typhoons, so it is a very, very much a, a real lived detail, but it's also so, uh, the symbolism for me was so apparent that I assumed, I, I liked it, but I assumed that you wouldn't like that passage. Well, what interesting, what, the thing you just mentioned, though, is you're talking about sort of an overall state. Like when you say Hong Kong is this thing that's sort of between the West and the East, it's sort of buffeted around. That's sort of an overall thing you can refer to or not even think about if you prefer to. But when you mentioned, for example, the section on wings and everyone wanting to put on wings and fly away, that for me almost got to Maoist levels of clear like, yes, I know lots of people wanted to leave Hong Kong and they totally did. That's sort of what I meant. There was a concrete event that happened in history and that's what we're talking about right here. Like there's just no possible way to be in the floating city you're sort of just sitting in history and, oh yeah, this floating city story is also happening. Whereas in some of the other sections that I think are better written or I like better anyway, um, you're really in the floating city. At least I am. Wow. You may be the first person in the history of anything to have compared Shishi to, to Maoist literature. Uh, Isn't that incredible? The, the, it's just I feel so, like I'm going to get hate mail for that. It's so different she she is an absurdist she's drawing off of this these absurdists i'm i'm thinking particularly of unesco uh not the un body but the the i think he's romanian french writer is that yeah. correct yeah um yes and, and and so much is so unclear in this work that I just don't understand how you can even suggest it has anything to well, do. It's the exact opposite of Maoist Not the literature. whole work. I just mentioned a passage that I really liked, and there are others that I really like and think are clever as well. But the sections that I don't like, I almost roll my eyes and go, yes, I get it. We're talking about the 80s in Hong Kong. Okay. Like, there, this passage couldn't possibly exist unless there was this historical reference, whereas others certainly could exist if you didn't know anything about Hong Kong. Um I don't think I just don't think that's fair. I mean, so many great literary works, Proust couldn't exist outside of his context, and there are some things that are but clearly references in, to, to events in in that. The difference particular. is that Proust gives you a complete world in which you can exist. If you've never been to the French countryside, you know zero about French history. You can still read Proust here. I, you can. I mean, you can read Proust. You don't have to have been to France to read Proust. Like, I, I don't people. think I that's. I don't think you can read Proust without knowing something about French history, uh, or you can, but it's just kind of hard to to figure things out. I I feel like with Xi Xi's work, I can give this to students who know nothing about Hong Kong's history, and they won't get all of the references. Sure, but they can live in that world, and it's a pretty cool world that she she constructs in her floating city it, it, it at its best it does have some really cool stuff absolutely i mean uh, we're sort of getting stuck in this i hate it you like it thing that's that's not what's what's happening there are sections i really don't like but there are sections that are really good i, I even highlighted quite a few of them and there's a, a sort of whimsical sense of humor that i like in a lot of the passages there's one in particular when they are there, this, there's a bunch of students looking at a picture of an umbrella, and the painting is called Hegel's Holiday, and they're trying to figure out what's going on in this painting because it doesn't, it it so rarely rains in the floating city, and it's their only source of water, so they really want it to rain, and they think, why in the world, what does Hegel have to do with an upturned umbrella filled with rain? Who knows? And then there's this, these two sentences. As for the problem of water, perhaps the philosopher Hegel might have been interested in giving it some thought. But it was a small problem, one he reserved for his holidays. <laughs> that, that just made me laugh. The idea of, first of all, Hegel ever taking a holiday because Hegel's just one of the most dour philosophers ever. And the idea of him taking a holiday and thinking about something whimsical is just kind of funny. <laughs> so there, there are these passages where at his best I laugh. There's a really peculiar, odd detail. I go, what is going on here? Yeah, Rob, I, I think clearly I've demonstrated that you're just wrong. Well, I defy anyone who has read about Hong Kong in the 1980s to read the wing section and not roll your eyes because you're like, okay, right, I get it. This, What in the world could this symbol be? Clearly, it's nothing. Although, you know, I, I, sh- I, I, I make that comment. I should point out you have a point about teaching. If I was going to be teaching about Hong Kong history, this would be a very different experience 
If it's just me sitting reading, I approach the text one way, but if I'm trying to introduce history in an interesting and peculiar way that's going to maybe have students think about it without ever having read it, this would be a, a pretty incredible story. And so I'm curious, when you taught it, how, how did the students respond? Some of them saw the connection. Others were like, what what the heck is going on? This is just craziness. They just res- re- responded only to the absurdity and didn't connect it to Hong Kong's history. So there's a real mm-hmm. bifurcation there. Uh, it, it was It's a fun text to teach, but even for undergrads, it's so just weird that it's hard for them to wrap their minds around. The ones that did make the connections, did the connections make the story interesting for them? I, I think so, yeah. Yeah, I mean... This is why, you know, when we started the podcast off, I said the the jury's kind of out for me on the story because there are things I just really don't like about it. There are things that are kind of hard to even articulate. It could just be a an impression I get, but all of a sudden thinking of a song with that title. But anyway, um, <laughs> I'm not going to sing it. But Oh, thank goodness. But the other parts, like I say, remind me of some absurdist writers I particularly like. So what do you do with a story where some of it you think is really great and other parts you're like, ugh, whatever. It's kind of kind of a strange mishmash for me. Fair enough. That's fine. You're wrong. Um, and I think that's a good place to end it. <laughs> right? All right. One of the other podcasts we ended with you effectively calling me really smart. So we'll end with you calling yourself right. <laughs> uh, Rob, uh, if if people want to hear about uh, uh, you know this date in Chinese literary history or or anything else, where should they check out on on their social media feed? Yeah, Chinese literature podcast, social media stuff, Twitter, Chinlit Pod, Patreon, Chinese literature podcast. We always love getting emails as well at Chinese literature podcast at gmail.com. And of course, the website, Chinese literature podcast.com. Um, if you're interested in reading the story, check out Kirk Denton's China, uh, a traveler's literary companion. Uh, it's one of the stories in this, this collection. The translation is pretty good. And I think we'll just end it there. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.